And I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about the work that we are doing at the University of Western Australia. Um, I, my talk will be a little bit different than some of the ones I've heard before because I'm not a clinician, I'm an auditory neuroscientist. So I'm going to talk to, to you today about data that's obtained from an animal model. And what I'm going to talk today is cochlear involvement in tinnitus. Because although in tinnitus it's generally accepted that a, that a cochlea is a trigger for tinnitus, it's also generally accepted that it's now a central phenomenon and therefore the cochlea is mainly ignored. However, we have found data in our laboratory that suggests that the cochlea is involved for at least some time after the start of tinnitus for, and that's necessary for tinnitus maintenance. So I don't have to tell you all that tinnitus is very prevalent, it affects about 5 to 50% of the population and it can severely affect the quality of life. And on that note, actually, in the Netherlands last year, the first case of euthanasia was approved on the basis of unrelenting, unrelenting suffering on the basis of tinnitus. There's yet no cure, as we've heard before, also during the keynote lecture from Ali Muller. But what we do know is that there is a strong correlation with hearing loss. And because there's a strong correlation with hearing loss, we also know the prevalence um, of ear loss is increasing and therefore the prevalence of tinnitus is thought to be rising. Now as a neuroscientist, what I'm interested in is what is the neural correlate of tinnitus. So what is changing in our brains that somebody perceives a sound where there's actually no physical sound being present? And because it's an abnormal perception, we generally assume that it's also an abnormal neural activity. So what do we know about what happens in the brain after hearing loss? We saw that also today already in the talk from Mark Williams. We see changes in tonal topic maps. We see increased synchronous activity between central structures. And we also see an increased spontaneous activity or hyperactivity in the auditory pathway. Now I must say here that all these changes generally occur always after hearing loss. But we also know that tinnitus does not always occur after hearing loss. And therefore, it is now also thought that there are also changes in non-auditory parts of the brain, possibly the limbic structure and another part that has been suggested in the paraphloclet of the cerebellum, which might have a modulatory action on the central auditory pathway. But that's not what I want to talk to you today about. I will talk about this increased spontaneous activity in the pathway. And we work on a guinea pig model to study hyperactivity and tinnitus. And what we do in the guinea pig model, so this is part of the auditory pathway for cochlear, cochlear nucleus to inferior cuicus. What we can do is measure the hearing loss in our guinea pigs, and we can measure the hearing loss by measuring the compound action potential of the auditory nerve. We measure thresholds at different um, uh, frequencies, and then basically we make an audiogram, yeah, a peripheral audi audiogram for the guinea pig. Then we provide them acoustic trauma, a pure tone acoustic trauma, so that's a very loud sound for about two hours while the animal is under anesthesia. And that creates a notch-like hearing loss at, at a frequency a little bit above the exposure frequency. And that has been shown by many other people. And we let the animal recover for a while, and then we have a terminal experiment during which we uh, anesthetize the animal and we record single neuron activity in the inferior colliculus. And we can also do behavioral tinnitus tests. But I'll first talk about this when we record the single neuron activity. So if you look at data, <coughs> this is data from control animals, so the animals have not had an acoustic trauma. Each dot is a single neuron that we have recorded uh, activity from. And what we do in these neurons, we record the characteristic frequency. So that's the frequency to which the neuron is most sensitive. And of course, due to the tonotopic map, it also has something to do with the location in the inferior cuicus. And then we record the spontaneous activity, so from low to high activity um, in the absence of sound. And you can see in control animal, it's very low, the activity. To be, to be precise, about 95% of the neurons have a very low, close to zero spontaneous activity under our anesthesia protocol. If you look, however, two weeks later, and we know it already occurs about 12 hours after the acoustic trauma, you can see an increase in activity, as shown over here. And we call this hyperactivity, so there's a significant increase. And in this case, after the acoustic trauma, you can see that the amount of neurons with a very low spontaneous fire rate reduces to about 60% of the neurons. 
Now, what you should also hopefully see is that this increased activity doesn't occur throughout the totoscopic map. It seems to occur around the exposure frequency of 10 kilohertz in this case. And so we hypothesize that this hyperactivity might be correlated with hearing loss. And indeed, when we did an experiment to try this, we actually caused two types of hearing loss in guinea pigs. So we had in one group of guinea pigs, we caused the hearing loss around 5 kilohertz, and then the other one around 10 kilohertz. And that's illustrated in this picture. So if you, have, if you expose the animals to a 10 kilohertz trauma tone, you get uh, hearing loss in the black line here. That peaks around 12 kilohertz. And after 5 kilohertz acoustic trauma, the hearing loss peaks about uh, 6 to 8 kilohertz. And if you then also plot the running average of spontaneous firing rates in inferior cleaflets, you see that there's a nice correlation. So there's a correlation with the region of hearing loss. Now, and some of you might think, who cares? Well, I care because this is my animal model for tinnitus, so I want to have it showing characteristics that resemble tinnitus. And we know from human studies that there is uh, a correlation between the audiogram versus the tinnitus pitch. So the pitch of the tinnitus often is in the same region as where the hearing loss occurs. Yeah? So we think <coughs> that this uh, makes the case stronger that hyperactivity might be involved in the generation of tinnitus. So uh, the other thing is, of course, I talk about tinnitus, but I need to show that my animals have tinnitus. Now, it's not that easy as, as in a human population where you just ask the patient, I've tried asking my guinea pigs, they never answer. So you have to come up with another technique. And this is the, we use the get pre pulsed inhibition of acoustic style. And it's a bit of a pity because Jeremy Turner has actually devised this technique and published this technique first. And he will talk at the end of the day. I was hoping to be after him, so he will have done the hard work, but I will give it a go. So what is it based on? It's, it's a variant of pre pulsed inhibition. And pre pulsed inhibition is a well described phenomenon in uh, psychiatry psychology, it's a psychophysical measure. Um, what happens is when you have a startle, so in this case a very loud, loud tone, so the animal or human, or the say three startle, has a, gives a little shiver, and you can measure this little shiver by having an animal on a vibration platform. So it measures the movement of an animal when it startles. In pre pulse inhibition, you would have a small pulse in front of it that normally doesn't provide any sort of behavioral response, but it causes inhibition of the startle response. Now, in this particular test, in the gap pre pulse inhibition of acoustic startle, your startle is embedded in a, in a much softer background noise, which in itself doesn't affect the startle. If you have a small gap in the background noise, this serves as a pre pulse. And what it does, it causes an inhibition of this startle. Yeah, it reduces in size. It is thought in tinnitus animal, animals that the startle is not so much affected. But if your background noise resembles the tinnitus, the gap is thought to be filled in by the tinnitus, and you have less inhibition. So what you have is you have large inhibition in animals that do not have tinnitus, you have a little bit of inhibition in animals that have tinnitus. And that's how we'll show it in the next slide. So remember in our guinea pig model, we have a correlation between the hearing loss and between the running average of the hyperactivity. Now this was again, so we see a peak of the hearing loss and also the hyperactivity around 12 to 14 kilohertz. So what we always do is we run our gap pre pulse inhibition of acoustic startle with two types of background noise. One is a narrow band noise around 8 kilohertz. The other one is a narrow band noise around 14 kilohertz. And what you see then is before the acoustic trauma, the suppression is high, so no tinnitus. But a little while after, a couple of weeks after the acoustic trauma, you could see there was still suppression at 8 kilohertz. There was no tinnitus uh, resembling that kind of background noise. And you have a little bit of suppression left, <coughs> but not a lot at 14 kilohertz, which suggests that the animals, after a couple of weeks after acoustic trauma, actually developed tinnitus. So that's good. So we now we have a model that have, where we have hearing loss, we have increased spontaneous activity in the brain, and we have tinnitus. So then our next step was can we modulate hyperactivity? And the idea is, of course, if you can modulate hyperactivity in the brain, can we eventually modulate tinnitus? So we did some experiments to do that. So we again we call we had an acoustic trauma. A couple of weeks later, we started to record in the inferior cleaflet over there, and then we silenced the auditory nerve. And we silenced the auditory nerve in many different ways. We did cochlear ablation, so we basically crunched the whole cochlea with a forceps. And we also did some more subtle ways by infusing the cochlea with several blockers of activity. And they all provide the same 
set. And that's illustrated here. So this is the data that you normally see after a couple of weeks of after tissue trauma. And this experiment was done between one and six weeks after the acoustic trauma. And when you ablate the cochlea, then you immediately get a reduction of the hyperactivity. So we thought that's cool. <coughs> yeah, so by stopping the activity of auditory nerve, you can stop the hyperactivity. <coughs> However, if you do it at later time points, <coughs> then this is not the case. So when we did it at 8 to 12 weeks after acoustic trauma, we could not completely uh, uh, eliminate the hyperactivity. And that's summarized in this picture, where I actually took the mean spontaneous activity per group. This is my shams. So this is a controlled animal, so they have low spontaneous activity. And then we look at acute ablation at different times after it was strong. So up to six weeks, you can see that the ablation actually brought the mean spontaneous firing rate back to control levels, but at later time points, this was not the case. So what does that mean? Well, it's, it could mean that at these time points, the auditory nerve itself shows hyperactivity. However, in general, if any sort of paper that has been that has been describing the spontaneous activity of auditory nerve after cochlear trauma describes, if anything, a decrease of spontaneous activity. So that is not the case. So instead, we suggest that there is a biphasic progression, so a two-stage pro process of central hyperactivity. In the first weeks after cochlear trauma, the central neurons become hyperexcitable. So they give an additional gain to the information that's still coming from the cochlea. And then later the central neurons become intrinsically overactive. And they don't rely on any sort of, uh, any, any type of um, activity coming from the cochlea. And it means that we suggest that there would be a therapeutic window. A therapeutic window early at a stage of affinity. So that's something we wanted to have a look at. So the question was, we know that reducing the spontaneous activity in stage one reduces hyperactivity. Can we also reduce symptoms? <coughs> so how do you do that? Because you don't want to go around and crunch the single cochlea. That would not be a good therapeutic uh, type to do. So, but so we would look for a drug that would actually lower the spontaneous activity of the auditory nerve, but would not affect uh, the tone evoked responses. And such a drug exists as frosemide. Frosemide is a loop diuretic which affects membrane transport. So it affects kidneys, the diuretic, but it also affects the inner ear. It is well described that it decreases the spontaneous rate of, spontane of um, auditory nerve fibers by lowering the endocochlear potential. And it has also been described as being able to suppress tinnitus in some human patients. However, the writers of these papers always suggested that the suppressive effect of rosemite was due to an increased activity at the level of the auditory nerve. Whereas I'm suggesting that it works because the, in the patients in which it works, they are in the first stage of tinnitus development. So we were going to try this in our model. So again, in our hearing model, cost of partial deafness by acoustic trauma, and we recorded. So then we measured the effect of ferrosamide on brain activity, and we measured the effect of ferrosamide on tinnitus. So an acute injection of rosemite, we showed, was able to suppress the spontaneous firing of auditory nerve fibers as well as the hyperactivity, in line with our previous experiment. So here we measure the, these are four animals in different colors, where we measure the spectrum of the neural noise, which is a measure of the spontaneous activity of auditory nerve fiber. And you can see after the injection of rosemite here at the dotted line, within a 30 minutes in full, you can see the spontaneous activity significantly dropping of the auditory nerve. We also showed that injection of rosemite, so here's the spontaneous activity after the cochlear trauma, it's very high, and after the rosemite, it dropped in significantly. So the, the drug was able to suppress the hyperactivity, as we have shown before. Then we did the gap prequels inhibition of acoustic startle. As a sham treatment, we gave the injection an injection of saline. So again, here you have your suppression. So High suppression means no tinnitus. There's this green line, dotted line, that's an arbitrary line just for your visualization of the effect. So above the line means no tinnitus, below the line means tinnitus. So before the trauma, the animal didn't have tinnitus. Some weeks after the trauma, they developed tinnitus. Then straight where this was shown in the test, and immediately after they received an injection of saline or rosemite, and an hour later they were tested again. Now you can see that the saline didn't have any effect as expected, 
But when we injected furosemide with a single injection of furosemide, you can see that there was a reversal of the behavioral tendency. This suggests that furosemide reversed the effects of uh, tinnitus, got rid of the tinnitus. So in conclusion, I then <coughs> suggest that furosemide can suppress the behavioral signs of tinnitus in our animal model. It also strengthens the argument that hyperactivity is involved in the generation of tinnitus, because here we have a drug that affects hyperactivity and affects the tinnitus. And it also supports the notion there might be a therapeutic window for some time after acoustic trauma. So what's next? Well, of course, next is, can we show proof of principle of this in human suffering? So we have just, I've just started a collaboration with Professor Friedland, an otolaryngologist from the Ear Science Institute of Australia. And we will start a human study, we will start recruiting patients. And what we want to do is show a correlation between the duration of how, how long a patient has tinnitus and how well the drug works. Yeah? So we will provide them in a week on course. We of course also have started investigation into more chronic effects of furosemide because of course a tinnitus patient doesn't care whether he is acutely off his tinnitus if it comes back an hour later, he's not really helped. So we need to find a way to make it longer lasting. And of course are there other options besides furosemide? And then of course, even if the furosemide can help people who have only just developed tinnitus, <coughs> it doesn't help the very large group that's out there that has, that has had tinnitus for a very long time. So we're also looking for treatment, for centralized treatment um, tinnitus in our model. Now I will be very brief about the other options. So there's another way to modulate activity in the cochlea, is extracochlear electrical stimulation. We know that extracochlear electrical stimulation of the round window or the promontory can suppress activity of the auditory nerve. Um, suppression of tinnitus has been reported in patients that's very acute when you start stimulating. But the mechanism is not known, and it might be due to this reduction of central hyperactivity, which is something we've set out to investigate. So again, we have our model, and then we did round window stimulation. And when you do round window direct current stimulation, this is what you see, this is just a single uh, example. So here we have a neuron showing spontaneous activity. You can also see the, the neurons bursting, which is what you see often. And then if you give negative current, so this is the moment for current, there, there, there. You can see there's an increase in the hyperactivity. And when you give positive current, you can see a reduction of the hyperactivity. We also found only small effects on thresholds and tone evoked activity of the inferior colliculus neuron, which may mean that electrocochlear electrical stimulation, extracochlear electrical stimulation, may be a viable approach for suppressing some forms of peripheral dependent tinnitus, so of tinnitus in the early stages, Although I have to say that you have to find a way to do it charge balance, because by providing direct current alone, if it's not charge balance, you do more damage than good. And that's what I want to leave it at. I want to thank my uh, sponsors, Action on Hearing Loss from the UK, Neurotrauma Research Program and the NHMRC, which is a national funding uh, agent in Australia. Of course, my team, including uh, Professor Don Robertson, who I've worked with for a very long time, and some of my international collaborators. Thank you very much. Uh, Any questions? Any questions?
straight after the injury you have a reduction of people they have certain changes in the brain they are well described changes in, in the in the balance between inhibition and excitation but these changes again you know seem to evoke further changes and again when, when you look at the paper that describes molecular changes they see changes over time so i think the plasticity goes on for a very long time before it actually settles on something maybe it never settles because once you have an abnormal activity in the brain it might you know have further changes and, and the longer you go and the more further you go with the collective changes, the harder the thing will be to treat because there will also spread over multiple structures. Um, that's the least of how I can speak. Well, that also, yeah, that's true. That also uh, accounts for more central things because uh, when you sleep and collaborate, that's have shown that connections in the brain are changed, uh, are different in people with teenagers. But it's different. Changes are different in onset teenagers or short term teenagers and long term teenagers. So that means that in the brain there are changes, there are uh, differences in people with teenagers and non teenagers, but these differences keep going. 